How's it going, everybody? And welcome back to another edition of the podcast. In today's episode, we have a very special guest, Justin Groth, also known as Fitness Extraordinaire. He has his own personal training facility and has a very solid background in bodybuilding. Today, we're going to get to know a little bit more about him, but... As a cautionary warning, this episode is rated E for explicit. There is some adult language. If you are sensitive to adult language, you might want to go ahead and skip this episode. But without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right into it. So what do you want to talk about? I mean, tell me a little bit about yourself. I, I know that you started <laughs> out, we went to school together. You probably, I don't know if you were lifting back then. No. But Mm-mm. I remember before the DMs, so we're talking like Facebook days, mm-hmm. I slid in the messenger. I hit you up because I was slid going to the- Slid in the DM, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I hit you up on messenger and I was like, hey man, I'm, I'm going to the gym. I saw you were doing your thing. You'd already competed in a competition. Mm-hmm. So tell me about that journey when you first started out. Uh, the competition journey? Well, just like or just getting I, into getting lifting. into fitness and lifting. And so, for those of you who don't know, real quick, I'm talking to Justin Groth, owner, fitness extraordinaire, personal trainer, all around just badass guy. Hey, so. thank you, brother. I appreciate <laughs> that introduction. Thank you. Um, first of all, man, it's it's a pleasure being on your channel. Definitely appreciate the opportunity, man. So, uh, how I got into lifting was I wasn't into lifting at all through my high school era. You know, a lot of the guys, they, they start getting their foundation and principles through football or sports training, whatever it may be. I wasn't a baseball, but I wasn't a lifter at all. Uh, I wasn't really, I didn't really start getting into my physical appearance in terms of my body until after high school, probably around 19 years old when I started going to Cuesta. Um, and even then it was very, Minuscule. I was going to the gym maybe once or twice a week. Um, I'd see my buddies get pumped up, and that's kind of what initially initially inspired me to go work out. And you know, I just work on the show muscles, your chest and biceps. It's all yeah. the shit I knew. I didn't know anything else, and so no squats, no. no squats, none of that shit. And um, well, my mom had a personal trainer at the moment, and I said, I, my mom actually wanted me to get with her. And it was this, she was a yoked, like sixty <laughs> year old. Uh, uh, just she wasn't a competitor, but this girl was in shape, man. Like yeah. by by the standard today, like if I was to see her in the gym, I'd be like, "Fuck, she's in shape," you know. <laughs> and uh, so, but I wasn't like intimidated. I should have been. I don't know why I wasn't, but I ended up going and seeing her three times a week. And I had, I only had visions of becoming. This is going to be so fucking embarrassing. I'm going to share it anyways. <laughs> and I told her, I just want to look like an Abercrombie model. That type of body, that's what I want. <laughs> well, I mean, goals. Yeah, so, that was know. my goal at the moment. I kept reiterating, I want, I just want to be toned, just want defined. To that's it, you know? So she structured my program as such. And um, I saw a little bit of result from her, but I only was with her for probably a month and a half, two months, I started doing it on my own. Yeah. My personality, super addictive. So when I find something that I start to enjoy and much, much more love, I go full force. That's just my personality. It's always been that way. I'm thankful I never stepped into drugs or alcohol because I think I'd be a fucking addict. Yeah, you know, and I would, tendencies. Yeah, I would go on the opposite direction. So I thank God for that, man. But I, um, I started training alone more often and that gave into, or that kind of segued into more sup- like supplementation. So then I started supplementing with protein and creatine and yada, yada, yada. And by yada, 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 I don't mean drugs. I mean, just <laughs> all the other like yeah, powders and BCAs shit. Yeah, BCAs and all, all that, that pre-workout. All those other things, yeah. So I ended up, uh, starting to work out with a couple buddies, and that became now it became a weekly thing, like a almost everyday thing. Yeah, I started eating better, living more of that life, right? And um, I I started building my body up more, and again, it just kind of dominoed into more of a addiction. But it yeah. was like it was becoming an addiction, but it was a slow, slash lifestyle for me now. 
Now you fast forward maybe a year or two down the road, um, I was um, I would be working out and I would I would have uh, gentlemen and even uh, the female crowd come up to me and ask me what I was doing or why I was doing that particular exercise or what would be good to do this or to gain this type of muscle here or, yeah. or what, to build this muscle up or whatever. And uh, I, I just found myself super feeling super rewarded when I would educate or edu- and just share the knowledge that I had that yeah. was so fundamentally 101 to me because it had been ingrained for the last two years and maybe it wasn't to these folks. Yeah. So that made me super... Um, that made me just super feel super good about this, what I was doing. So I was working out with a buddy of mine that had been competing for, I don't know, had like then seven, six or seven competitions. And um, he, I'm going to drop his name. He'll never <laughs> hear this, but this is the dude. This is, this is the dude I would say that really introduced me to the competitive world because he was a bit competitor already because he had great genetics and he was just, he was already doing the damn thing. And I had, I had looked to him like, not necessarily an idol at all, but more of like a, just a guidance or a mentor. Yeah. So he was, he was the first guy that I would call such as a mentor to me. But even in that stroke, it was very minuscule. He was just there. But even to this day, massive respect for this guy. I just, every time I'm around him, I give him the respect that I feel he deserves and such and such, right? Yeah. So his name is Andy Warwick, and he was one of the guys, I say, that just kind of introduced me to this sport. And I remember, I still remember when he told me, Justin, have you ever thought about competing? You should because you have good genetics. It was just that one-liner yeah. That fucking changed everything for me. And I still remember what machine we were working on. I still remember, <laughs> we were doing lying ham curls. And I remember him saying, after I got done with my sets, yeah. he said that. And I, and you know, those moments in time, you just, they're photographic. They're, and you just, you, it's like you subconsciously photograph them and they're just with you forever. That's yeah, yeah. a time that I remember and I'll remember forever. So he, re, he I remember him telling me that. And then that's when it ingrained in me and I felt I should probably make it a reality. So I told him, I said, look, man, but I don't want to compete unless I'm competing at a heavyweight. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, when you're competing as a heavyweight, you're about 196 in a court. Unless the stats have changed, 196 fucking shredded. (laughs) That, That is hard to do as a natural bodybuilder. Yeah. Even unnatural that's super hard to be like four or five percent or leaner yeah and be that weight so that's a lot of muscle that's a lot, a of, lot muscle. of muscle and even though i'm not the shortest guy i'm not the tallest guy i'm about five ten five ten i always say five ten five ten and a half i don't yeah. count the half i round down <laughs> five ten <laughs> so he um went well when he when he said that it may be Think about competing, but I told him that, and he said, look, I understand that you want to compete as a heavyweight. It's not unrealistic, but I wouldn't wait until you're a heavyweight at that, at that body fat percentage, lean body fat percentage. Yeah, yeah. Initially, he was trying to say, look, dude, you're never going to get there. Fucking do it now. <laughs> so I said, so I went home. I talked to my mom about it. My mom said, Just, she calls me Just or lover. <laughs> <laughs> whatever <laughs> one of the two yeah. she said you need to just do a show now and this was about 2008 okay so um just to give you a timeline 2008 and he's and, and so i just i got in line with who his coach was which was dr jill komzeski he for those of you who don't know he's a a world-renowned uh doctor, natural bodybuilder, um, a guru, but more, much more, more of a the godfather of natural bodybuilding preparation, oh, getting really? people in prep in, in, in uh, contest shape. He's made hundreds of professionals, um, super, super knowledgeable, very, very well-rounded all around great guy, man. Um, so I got in touch with him that led, that started, that kind of, uh, kickstarted the journey for my, uh, preparation for the first contest 
First contest was in 2009. So I dieted for about, well, I prepped, contest prep for about eight months, nine months. And how did that change your training style? Because I mean, when you're in there and you're just typically bodybuilding and you're working out, was it much of a change when you then had to transition into, okay, this is competition mode. This is a start date and here's, yeah. here's the timeline. I think, I think it did, I'm going to choose my words. I think it did, but one thing about me is that it's really hard for me to level up when I'm already feel when I already feel like I'm in it. Yeah. It's hard for me to do much more. Even to this day, when I train, I train with an intensity as if I were competing, but it's just because that's the motor engram that's been ingrained in my nervous system. When I hit the floor, when I train in the gym, or when I'm under the bar, when I'm under a load, that is the intensity or that is the that is the programming in my brain all of the fucking time. Yeah. So it's hard for me to, and be, I was that way before that. I do think that it definitely probably jump-started me, or not jump-started, but it propelled me maybe, gave me a little turbo in the gotcha. beginning. But I don't, I wouldn't say much because that was, but that's my personality. That's how I'm programmed when I'm addicted to something. So it's like you had already been training for a marathon and then when it's like, hey, a marathon's coming up, you're marathon ready year round. So when it came to training for this competition, you were already in go mode from the get-go right. before you even really knew it. Right, right. And it, like I said, it may have augmented a, t- a tad, but I can't say by much. I don't think it augmented by much. Yeah, yeah. And um, I just ended up going full bore for that eight months with, with uh, you know, for those of you who are, who are competitors, you understand this, but kind of... Um, segmenting your life and compartmentalizing a lot of things to revolve around training and being your best because you don't want any questions that are unanswered when you come on stage. When you hit the floor on stage, you don't want to look back and be like, whoa, fuck, I missed that cardio session. Maybe that's the reason why I'm not going to win today. Or maybe that's the reason why I'm not as lean as I could be. Or that's the reason why I'm not as full or whatever. You don't want any questions unanswered. So you do exactly what you need to do and to 100%, if you want to be your best, come that date, even if you lose, you know, that's, that's your mentality. That's, those yeah. are competitors' mentalities. And if that's not your mentality, you shouldn't be a competitor. So either way, I did my first show. I got fourth. And out of a, I don't think there was like nine or ten guys split. That's and, not bad um, for your first show. And, but, I, but I look back on it now, and I definitely wasn't even the condition that I should have been going into that show. Like yeah. if I were that conditioning now, knowing what I know now, I would have never even stepped on stage because I just wasn't, I was maybe like 7% body fat and I don't hold my body. Like if I'm 12%, I look like I'm spewing fat. I need to be under 10 all the time for me to look some type of, some it didn't type, look of type of conditioning or yeah. shape. Yeah. So I, I tell Joe, I say, I want to do another show. I want to, and there's an there's Orange County Classic coming up in four more weeks. He said, let's do it. Usually competitors get a little bit leaner riding into their next show. Yeah. They, have a, they have a refeed, a couple refeed days after their show, and then they, and kind of, you know, resets, obviously some metabolic uh, hormones, and we can go back in the, the next show looking a little bit better. Maybe get a little bit more fat loss. Yeah. So we did that. I won the next show. I won my class in the next show. I and that was out of a spread of about 12 guys. So I felt really good about that. But then it just kept my addictive personality. I just kept going. I did six shows that year. <laughs> wow. Fucking back after, after, one after another, back, back to back. See, now I didn't know that. I didn't know you were hitting shows that hard. Well, the way I looked at it was I'm already in condition. Yeah. Fuck it. Let's do another show. <laughs> and I, I, like lo- I, like I love that. the cheat meal day yeah. after the show. So I ca- there was a slight, you know, when a slight you, reward. To yeah. That. You have a you have a kind of a a sinister outlook on food when you're a competitor because you want to eat, but you can't. Yeah. And it's just human to want to eat, you know, indulge in your favorite foods, you know? So I felt like Wow, this is kind of giving me an outlet to eat that food, yeah. As well as possibly bring home another trophy. So it was that dopamine hit that I was chasing, 
every single time I went to a show. Yeah. A reward. Um, so anyways, <laughs> that, that transpired into um, that competitive side, transpired me into being a personal trainer to others and helping others show or, or, or show other people exercise physiology or explain that and educate others on, on what I felt was so fundamental to me yeah. because it's something that I did daily. And so I felt like, why not share this, obviously? And for those who are listening who might not know Justin or might not follow him on Instagram, because those are where I see your stories and I get that hype and I get that intensity from you. Thank you, man. So where can people find you? What's your, what's your handle? IG handle, fitness extraordinaire, one word. It's fitness extraordinaire. Um, yeah, I'll be putting that in the show notes and I'll put a link in the, in the description down below. So be sure to give Justin a uh, look him up and check out those stories. And so you, when it came into personal training, kind of how did that journey lead you to then starting your or getting into your own facility? I, I had spoken with another personal trainer and he sort of went through like um, working through another gentleman who had his own facility. So it wasn't the commercial gym route. Mm -hmm. What was the, the path that you took? So I did the commercial gym thing for two months. <laughs> two fucking I'm seeing, months. I'm seeing that look on your face and I know there's a story. So I did it for two months and I'm going to be blatantly honest like I am with everything, even if it hurts me. So in my commercial gym, um, I, I was one of the first trainers in that gym because they were really uh, poor organized facility yeah. uh, to begin with. Even though they were a big name, they were poorly organized. So they have any trainers and I came on board and I said, look, I want to I do some personal training here. They said, okay, well, we'll give you a 60-40 split. Okay, so that was, back then, that was typically the, um, that was typically kind of the, 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 the regular the, yeah. the, in terms of uh, what you get paid out for a trainer. And I ended up doing it for two months. I gained maybe, I had maybe five or six clients, two of which were my family, my mom and my, my aunt. Okay. And the reason why I got so, I guess I stopped, well, the reason why I stopped was because I didn't like going to the gym and seeing all my buddies work out and get pumped up. And then I'm over here training people and I feel all like sucked up, no pump, nothing like that, right? So yeah. I'm coming from that, that narcissist, egotistical bodybuilding, bodybuilder mentality. I want to be in here getting pumped up. Yeah. And I'm seeing all my buddies lift weights, get pumped up. And, and, and you know what that feels like. When you know what it feels like and you're on the outside, you, you become, well, for me, I was, non, I was starting to become less engaged with who I was with because I was becoming frustrated that I couldn't be lifting too. Yeah. So two months, it took me to realize I can't do this shit no more. I don't want to do it. This is, this is boring now. Yeah. Because when I went into training, I thought, like everybody thinks, and this is the huge misconception about personal trainers, when you go into personal training, you're not going to be training your buddies. Period. End of story. That shit doesn't happen. Yeah. You know why? Because you're now you're charging a dollar amount and they don't want to pay that shit. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to pay you for something that they could probably get for free yeah. if you were before you were a trainer. Like they don't, they don't see the value in you when you're set at a dollar amount. Because so, so what I'm trying to say is you'll never train your friends. You'll likely never do bodybuilding training unless you niche yourself and anchor yourself in that niche. Yeah. Respectively. But you're not going to make a lot of money if that's, or you're not going to be that successful if that is your... If you don't diversify yourself. You can't diversify yourself. Yeah. And when I talk about being successful, if success means to you, you're just doing bodybuilding. You're only making maybe, you only have two or three clients, but you feel gratitude with that and you're, and you're, you're excited about that, then that's success to you. But to be a trainer, I think you should, you should spread yourself out to a, to learn a lot more about the body than just three sets of 10 yeah. rest pause sets drop sets mechanical drop sets i think there's so much more in the scope of 
in the scope of personal training because now you can treat more people. Yeah. And now you can affect more people. So I'm all about finding your niche, but with respect to being able to treat a large amount of people because then you can actually develop, obviously you can deliver more quality to more people. Yeah. It's not, it's not just about, and I'm going to say it again, it's not just about banging weights. There's more to being a personal trainer if you're authentic in personal training. Yeah. There's more to being a trainer than just training bodybuilding style, you know? Um, well, at least for me, that was, that was, that's my gig, at least for me. Um, if, if I were only training bodybuilders, I wouldn't have it. I wouldn't, I don't feel like I would have the impact on people that I have, or at least the little impact that I feel like I have today. Um, and that is the reasoning why I went into the craft in the beginning. Yeah. It wasn't to be a fucking millionaire. Cause I can't, I don't think I can be a millionaire being a personal trainer. That's not <laughs> something that I, that I am fixated over either. Yeah. I, I went into personal training for the authentic feeling that I want to help people, period. Yeah. That's it. So, um, <laughs> on that note, <laughs> fuck. Well, I mean, you mentioned, you know, putting a dollar amount on your time. And I know that with me initially starting out with photography and things like that, I had to do a lot of free shoots in order to build my portfolio. And then there's that transitional phase when you now have to monetize your time and find out what you're worth. And what was that like? What was that transition like for you when it became, now I need to value myself, I need to know my worth. And believe me, there are people out there, they are gonna pay you, clearly they pay you, they pay me photography-wise, fitness-wise for yourself. So how was that transitional phase for anybody out there who, who might be sort of straddling the, I'm, I'm making this transition, I need to monetize my time now? Yeah, I think it was definitely tough because by nature, I want to give. And I'm not, I'm not a giver in the sense that I just w will give and let you walk over me. I think there's a fine line with giving and letting people take advantage of you. But I, by, I, and I, my dad is the same way. I wanted to give a lot more and I didn't want to put a dollar amount because I didn't, I didn't want to want, it, want money to skew what I was doing. Yeah. I feel like money can skew a lot of shit in life and I didn't want people to skew my, my give yeah. with, well, but you know I have to get paid, right? Like that just ruined, I feel like that would ruin the, the, the good nature. Yeah, and, and the relationship with me and that person. And I started out giving a lot. I started out going to, to, the, to, my, to my gym on the weekends and setting people up with programs and going in on my off time to just set people up like with what they're doing and because they were asking me yeah. and they were friends, but they weren't, some of them weren't really good friends. I just kind of acquaintance, I knew them, you know, yeah. or, or they were friends with my cousin or whatever, um, or friends of my, my parents or, or people that just knew me in the gym and they were, they were looking to change their bodies and they were looking to get some guidance and I would go on them off time. I don't know what, propelled me to do that other than just like a passion it, it had to have been just a passion right? and I can speak on that too because I remember when I sent you that message it was probably pretty short but you just had a wealth of information and Thank here you. it like it it quite literally jettisoned me on the path towards finding the the sort of the fittest shape for myself at the time and so just that in itself anybody could have said hey just google it youtube it yeah so, so I want to, I want to stop that, our conversation and tell you that that's <laughs> super humbling for me to hear that. And none of that I take lightly, man. So I appreciate that. That's a lot of the reason why I continue to do this is yeah. because of instances like yourself and you, you, you reiterating that to me, that's super big for me. That'll always be big for me. Always, always, always. And that's something that you can't put a dollar amount on. And that's something that just, again, will always stick with me. And I, I really, just really formally, uh, sin sincerely thank you for that, man. That's, that's, yeah. that's awesome for me to hear that. And I mean, thank you, because seriously, like, I tell my wife the story all the time. Like, I was a cardio bunny. I was on 
the elliptical for like an hour straight. I thought, hey, this is like a video game. As long as I burn a thousand calories a day, right. I'm good. My diet was just total a total train wreck. I was probably ruining my metabolism. And then I seen your pictures, your bodybuilding competition stuff. And I was like, well, let me ask him a question real quick. And I, I think I'd ask you like maybe two or three questions. Like I asked you about weightlifting and you gave me sort of like a, a, a spiel on weightlifting which got Spiel. me to yeah <laughs> it, it got me to walk upstairs because this was a two-story gym got me to walk upstairs and into the weight room and not on the machines but actually on free weights and then I had a question about supplementation proteins creatines things like that and again there with the information and I started out with the protein I didn't dive into creatine just yet and then it was okay well let's talk about fat burning and that's when you introduced me to that uh was it L carnitine or carnitine carnitine and, and you start telling me about those things fish oils and healthy fats and so just those three messages and then i'd start doing my research on youtube and looking into all this stuff so really like what you're doing and and the training that you do for the community when you speak on that because you know training bodybuilders that's one thing but uh, having a positive effect i mean you planted your roots here and you have positive effect that resonates throughout the community. Thank you, brother. In what you do. Thank so. you, man. Super, super gratifying to hear that from you, man. I, you know, I, I wouldn't have imagined that just me writing that and, and, and touching on those topics that it would have, it would have planted a seed in you. Yeah, because like the way it did. I do. I have those addictive tendencies as well. And when I first met my wife, like. It was all about the dating and the relationship, so I got addicted to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I've sort of had to find the healthy balance between, you know, being in a relationship and hitting the gym right. and now being a father. So right. it's sort of all those three things. I still get my hour in at the gym, but, you know, my main priority is on the home front and really trying to get it right in the kitchen. So absolutely, your posts back in the day, they were pretty wild. I want to talk about your cheat meals. Yeah. Yeah, let's What's do it. up with that? <laughs> What's up with? <laughs> I told you that bodybuilders have a sick, <laughs> a, a sinister approach to food, man. Because again, it's something that you restrict yourself from. So when it comes that day, you're going fucking ham. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> and that's what I did. And um, I was, I was able to, I mean, through my efforts in the gym and through the, through my. Um, through my excessiveness in dieting, I was able to just burn it off, you know? And, and it doesn't affect you as much. It wouldn't affect me. It's like one bad meal out of 36 meals is going to wreck me. Just like one good meal out of 36 bad meals is not going to make me better. So I, I just, I, I was, I was able to, I kind of took advantage of it a little bit when it came to that day, but I, you know, and I did a lot of food, yeah. but I started feeling like I was solely focused on that day of eating that I was developing a, less than positive relationship with food. I was now yeah. becoming, I was, I was feeling, I was just, just wasn't a good relationship with food. I was, I was starting to manifest because of that, because of that indulgent day where I just, it didn't matter what I, you know, when I woke up the next day feeling super shitty, uh, upon being bloated and looking like a, a fucking blowfish, I was <laughs> just feeling like shit in my gut, you yeah. know, and it was affecting the way I was talking. It was affecting my, my educational spiel towards my clientele. That's when it become a halting, when it became a halt for me. And I just, I have to now, I have to do something different because this is too, this is too excessive. Again, the addiction came over and I started to rotate in the other direction towards indulging in shit foods, you yeah. know, just to kind of get all those cravings out. But I was making more cravings as I was feeding the cravings. Does that make sense? Oh, and definitely. that's just the chemistry of the brain. So I was just continuing to just eat, even though I didn't even want to eat, I just wanted to get all the cravings out because I knew I wasn't going to do this shit until next Sunday, another week from now. That's a long time, yeah. especially when you're eating nothing but chicken and sweet potato every day until that day. Yeah. I just wanted to get... You know, you want to get all the cravings out. So it was un I was developing a, definitely an unhealthy relationship with the food. And I, that's not what I preach. So I had to take a step back and realize, Justin, this is not what you preach. This is not something that you should embark in yourself. Even if you can, you can 
it, you cannot be affected by it. You still shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. It's not a part of your authenticity or your integrity rather, I should say. So that's what changed for me. And I started splitting up my days. So I would do one cheat meal on Wednesday, one cheat meal on Sunday, which calorically was even less than I was doing on one Sunday. Cause I was doing like, cause you were going ham, like you- three cheat meals, cereal at the end of the night everything i didn't give yeah. a shit it was just whatever so <laughs> Those pictures were pretty wild right like, i remember looking at them I'm like damn like this guy's <laughs> but from from a young age man i've always been able to just eat i would yeah. eat my friends uh, food if they weren't done with their if they wouldn't if they didn't want theirs i would eat their food i would eat my you know i would eat off a plate if, if they were done when yeah. i was done because i could just eat a lot and i was in high school growing up, i was never obese i never had a a, I never had a discrepancy with my weight. I was always 160, 165 in high school for my height. That's about average. I mean, yeah. I, I just, I had a little love handle. That's it. That was just never, you know, it was, it was never an issue with me. And so I just always, and I never had, I never had an issue with gaining weight, like t- to the excessive level, yeah. you know? And you mentioned the, the sweet potatoes, the chicken, has yeah. your diet changed much or is it still just a typical, like a standard bodybuilding diet? So now, uh, and since about 2013, I've, I've intermittent fasted. So oh, okay. I do that daily. Um, I have been doing that for, like I said, for years, since 2013. In different, in different um, segments, you know, like I've done 16-hour windows. I've done 12-hour windows. Um, I just recently did a podcast with a guy. He's in Australia and he teaches intermittent fasting. So yeah. I kind of up to speed on it a right. little bit. So that's right. pretty cool. So it, it's, it's pretty basic. Um, I, I like the intermittent fasting because I could now not worry about prepping my food all the time. I could go home, have a hot meal between my, my clients. And, and so it worked well for me and I was getting all my calories in a one day. I can eat already as it is a lot at one time. Yeah. So it just, it went well with my with my, with my style of eating or the way that I was, right? So, and my, and my lifestyle. Um, now, I mean, it's, I still eat the same, it's around, I eat around my first meal around one o'clock, my last meal is around eight. So it's usually between sometimes earlier, sometimes later, depending on, sometimes I'll eat at three and my last meal will be at eight. So as a, you know, that's only a five hour window of, of food that I'm taking in. Yeah. But, or, but calorically it's the same and I, I go back and forth with macros. So I'll go I'll have eggs and oatmeal. I'll be in an eggs and oatmeal kick. Nothing but eggs and oatmeal, a couple things on the side, but nothing that's like horrible processed, nothing like donuts or anything like that, pop tarts yeah. and that shit. So No, if it fits your macros. Right, style. no, that. If it fits your macros is bullshit. <laughs> so I- Keeping it real. <laughs> we, we, and we can get into the if it fits your macros shit because I have a lot to say about that, but- We'll keep it. We'll keep it level <laughs> for now. So I was uh, eggs and oatmeal. Then I'd be on like chicken and sweet potato. Then I'd be on chicken and rice. Depending whatever I was, I would just switch up my carbs and my proteins. I really wouldn't do much with the fats. I wouldn't switch up my fats. There's no really no point to switch up your fats. I would decrease and and I would decrease and and increase the level of fats depending yeah. on how much carbohydrate I was having. Um, but it just depends on the way I'm looking. I really just gauge it on the way I look. And that's for my bodybuilding competitive days. I just, I'm always gauging my foods off of my conditioning and how I look in the mirror and how I feel in the gym. You know, strength has never really gone up or down for me, even, even that much in my, in my preparation days. I mean, I would say maybe four weeks before the contest, my strength would decline pretty rapidly because that's when I'm getting a little bit more aggressive. Yeah. Um, but other than that, Nothing really changes in the scope of nutrition. Nothing, nothing should change. I mean, it, there, are, there are things that work, and that's what you keep in place. If it's not broke, don't fix it, motherfucker. Why? <laughs> you know, so that's, that's how I feel with that, and I keep it simple with that. There's yeah. so many other things that, I, that, I, that are complex in my life. Fuck that. I'm keeping nutrition simple. Yeah. And training simple, to be honest with you. Right on, man. And I want to thank you again for being a part of this podcast episode. I want to encourage everybody to take a look in the show notes and the links down below. Be sure to give Justin a follow, shout him out, slide in the DMs, whatever <laughs> you guys do out there. And Justin, thank you, man. My pleasure, brother. All right, you guys. Talk to you again in the next one. See ya.